Heidi ho campers, welcome to Guaranteed Audio, uh, episode 15, was it? Lucky 15. Lucky 15. That's uh, five times three for those following along at home. Uh, today is kind of a special episode. We're going to be talking about uh, our our host, our co-host Kevin's new documentary, uh, Not For Resale, a video game store documentary. That yeah. is the theme of the night. Yes. I am Kevin James, joined by Ryan Murphy. And you didn't introduce yourself. Oh, yeah. I'm Neil Cicerega. Yeah. The other guy. And uh, so this just came out. It just launched on a... Tuesday. Vim- yeah. On, on, and it's on Amazon Prime and on Vimeo. Yep. Right? And Blu-ray. And Blu-ray. You can get your copy, your stream, your 4K download of the movie over at gamestoredoc.com. Yeah, I guess we're going to talk about it because if uh, we don't pimp it, who will? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, it's it's a really good documentary. I was really pleasantly surprised. I'm oh, not surprised because I know you're good at. <laughs> it's a backhanded compliment. <laughs> well, look, it, uh, let me put it this way: uh, you've never made a feature-length documentary before. None of us have feature-length film. Period. Yeah, that's true. And uh, it's a huge project, and you did it, and it looks great, and it's got a great uh, atmosphere and uh, uh, tons of interesting things to think about, and. Um, I, I said earlier it's closer to an NPR piece than a pandering video game nerd documentary, right? That's what- Yeah, it took about three years, mm-hmm. and going into it, uh, Thomas Shalifor Draman, who's one of my close friends, we went to Fitchburg State University together, we started talking about the approach of the movie, the direction, because that would, you know, decide our shooting style, that would decide the people we interviewed, the locations we went to, and we knew we didn't want to just make another boy, video game fans are eccentric movie. <laughs> yeah. There are plenty of those. Um, I, I am old enough now to consider video games a part of Americana, and I thought, hey, let's give it a very grassroots, street-level, blue-collar tone, mm-hmm. and I think we pulled that off. I, the fun thing about talking about the movie in this context is that most people listening to this podcast are going to know Ryan Murphy, Neil Sariga, and Kevin James as a unit. <laughs> yeah. They're going to know us from the work we've done for the last decade and a half together and the hardest thing about this movie for me at times was working on it and then not showing you two what I was doing. Yeah, you couldn't for a long time. I really couldn't because I'm like, no, I'm directing this and you know, I have my friends who I'm working on this movie behind the scenes with. I have my colleagues. We're the ones making these decisions and I had to wait about two years to really show you two what I was doing. You guys sat down with me. You watched the movie and took notes and you guys gave me really constructive feedback at one point um ryan threw some money into the movie and i gave ryan's work a special cameo you see the movie and you look really close at one point there's a scene where youtube is being discussed as an example of algorithmically propagated content Mm -hmm. like you know how like machine learning and uh, servers are deciding what you see you're not your volition isn't picking the tv channel you put on anymore you're being served content and um i show youtube on screen and i went out of my way to make one of the videos that's on youtube squirrels which is a ryan murphy classic (laughs) (laughs) and um you're right next to uh the best iron man suit up scenes and a logan paul video (laughs) And that gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> now, it, it's kind of a, a, a close topic to us because we all started on YouTube back in the days when they used to curate stuff for the front page. Yeah. Human beings would, well, not always human beings. Sometimes it was democratic. It was like, this is the video that got the most likes today. Yeah. All that stuff is gone. It's all weird, uh, like, in you know, indistinguishable uh, logic picking videos now. Hey, you watch this one music video by a band. Here's like five more from the same band you might like. Yeah. Which, you know, there's a reason they do that. It works. Yeah. But yeah, the documentary, like I said, took about three years in total, and we are going to be screening it at PAX East later this month. By the time you hear this, this will be public knowledge. I'm being flown out to San Francisco to show the movie at GDC, the Game Developers Conference, which is a big deal for me. Uh, We screened it at the Independent Film Festival of Boston in, uh, at the Somerville Theater last April. That was the premiere, actually. You That's right. Cool. Yeah. You two guys were there. That was great. We sold out, which was nuts to me. Hundreds of people, a bunch of college students talked to me about the movie afterward and were asking me questions I wasn't prepared to answer. I've never had people ask me serious questions about <laughs> movies before. It's usually just like, man, how'd you make that eagle pick up that GameCube? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. A different video game movie I worked in. <laughs> All right. So, Kevin, asking you to summarize this movie would be 
Easier said than done. There is a lot of content covered, so let's do a question that you can actually answer. What is the thesis of this documentary? The big takeaway is the impact that new distribution methods are having on working class people. Um, and it's not just a David and Goliath story. It's not just, oh, hey, these people making their way through the world with this old means of self-employment versus the big machine. No, you kind of, uh, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. you do, you do the, the game stores that you pick are kind of a nice spread of success and shops that are in danger of closing. Yeah. Different ages of people, different yeah. parts of the country, which is a paramount thing for us. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like watching movies that purport to be nationwide. Oh, you're going to see the whole country in this movie. And it's just the same three towns. Or it's yeah. like, okay, here's New York City, here's LA, and here's maybe Chicago. Like, no, we, we actually, Thomas and I actually drove for three weeks cross country at the very start of this project during our research phase to go to, we went out to Oklahoma. We went to Chicago, North Carolina. Maryland, San Diego, Texas, Portland, Oregon, mm -hmm. Toronto. Parts of the country that don't have high-speed internet. Glenside, Pennsylvania, yeah. Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. <laughs> Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. I like that. Yeah. So and that's where they keep the pigeons. <laughs> that's <what> they <laughs> The battle pigeons. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to show a very genuine, authentic snapshot of uh, what was happening to lower and middle class people who were going into business. Because I love going into business stories. They're often my favorite types of stories, whether it's in film or even music. Now you went to, this documentary happens to be about video games, the history of video games, and you cover a lot of the independently owned video game stores. Mm -hmm. But a similar documentary, as you've seen in the past, could be made, have been, have been made about any, any kind of independent business, because yeah. you want to tell the story of independent businesses, which is often a lot of wing and a prayer, crossing our fingers, working long. You know, you yeah. you covered some, some real human stories here. There are some great record store documentaries out there. Mm -hmm. There's a blockbuster video documentary, but no one had really done, yeah, the video game store documentary. I just wanted to get in first. <laughs> wanted to do it before anyone <laughs> well, else did. <laughs> part of, you were living in Salem, Massachusetts. Yes. And your apartment was literally across the street from Game Zone. From Game Zone, a which is kind of like the, it's like the picture perfect small, used video game store, right? It's wonderful. It was built atop a jewelry store. It used to be a jewelry store. There's a great. I don't want to spoil it, but there's a great, uh, dark anecdote about the jewelry yeah. store. Yeah. And the funny thing is, is the fellow that owns the store, Neil Crockett, another Neil C. I know. Yeah. Um. He and I became really quick friends as I started shopping there. I would go there like five days a week. I would just stop by my way to or from work. And being a filmmaker and really wanting to make a feature film, the idea had already been in my head to make a documentary about video game stores as my first feature. But it was just like, this is clearly like the store. Like there's so many good stories here. He's so fun to talk to. We had to cut a lot of material. He talked a lot about the early days of renting media and how that wasn't commonplace and he literally would drive to Toys R Us and Child's World, this old kid's store, uh, toy store in the mm -hmm. 80s, and he would buy every copy of every, every Mario tape, as he puts it, and he would just rent them that way. You know, yeah. He would provide copies of these games to local blockbusters and such and independently owned video rental stores until he got the idea, oh, I'll make my own video game store in the back of magazines like people will order them from me and it's a funny story he, he he talks about how you know he used to run the uh, ad i have an old video game magazine that we used as um as a uh, inspiration for computer fighters yep uh it's just sitting in my bathroom currently it's like was, a game pro it's uh yeah it's like electronic a, gaming monthly something like that yeah it was a little more geared towards older audiences and i was flipping through it and uh, I saw an ad for uh, Neil Crockett's old store. Right Master there. the game. Master the game. I was like, hey, check it out. It's a wizard holding like a crystal ball talking about how you should buy video games through him because he's oh, yeah. the game master. It's wonderful. And there's this big long list of all these video game titles. Some of them are misspelled. Yeah. They all have prices. Prices haven't changed since the 90s. Yeah. Uh, despite... Uh, inflation. Yeah. Um, you still spent $60 on a copy of Mario two. <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, I was just like pointing out like, Oh, check it out. Here's a, you know, um, here's a terrible game and it costs like $50. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, something I was thinking about. I I, I rewatched the movie last night to be as fresh as possible. Are you possible. kidding me? Of course, yeah. You've, had watch, you've watched this movie like five times now. I've watched it a couple of times. Yeah, see, not as many I as you have. I've a lot of it. Not, not as many as you have. <laughs> yeah. Well, rewatching it last night, I tried to think of some questions that I hadn't thought of watching it before. Mm -hmm. And first up, it's important to be honest and truthful in yeah. a documentary setting, as you are honest and truthful about the things you depict. But you have so many real people, their real stores, their yeah. real names, their real stories, the tragedies and downfalls they've had to deal with and opening businesses and getting cars driving through the front door on the way to try and get things rolling. Before the store even opened. Before it even, right. <laughs> it's right. first day, before it's first day. <laughs> I wondered, you, you have to have excluded some information for people's privacy and security. Absolutely. But was there ever a point of adding misinformation for the sake of protecting these individuals? What do you mean, like pseudonyms or? Yeah, exactly. Or I mean, you'd want the you'd want the location of their storefront to be public. Okay, now I understand what you're saying. Yeah, uh, everyone we talked to about being interviewed was, I mean, they 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 were like, yeah, sure. But you want to talk about my business in a movie? Exactly. Let's they go. probably want you know yeah, any customers yeah. it might bring. We definitely had a few people who said yes over the phone, said yes via email, and then Tom and I would show up with our camera equipment, and they would go, oh oh, oh th th this is this isn't like smartphones and like, this isn't a high school project yeah you guys are making a real movie um hold on i have to go home and shave and come back like oh, that yeah. happened more than <laughs> once there, there were stories some people told us that would have made for good drama in the movie but um i thought it would have been in poor taste to exploit it for the themes of the movie we also just we didn't want to have an artificial good guy bad guy like this is the good video game store owner. here's the bad no, one yeah because yeah. that's uh, there have been good documentaries that have done that story yeah uh, I mean like I, everyone loves King of Kong King of Kong yeah but since King of Kong there's been a lot of artificial mm -hmm. framework put into other films no we wouldn't <laughs> want some idiot producer saying like yeah but who are the rich kids in the camp across the lake like no no <laughs> that's not yeah no I remember reality that's not I real I remember when you were first starting we talked about this a little bit yeah back when it, uh, it was kind of up in the air like what what kind of things are you going to cover yeah are you hoping to find a narrative as you go are you hoping to zero in on some characters and their individual struggles that would might hopefully kind of take the documentary over yeah uh that didn't happen necessarily mm -hmm. uh it, it's it's more of an ensemble piece, I think. A, a few people have said this about the movie, and I think it's very true that it's a moment in time film. Mm -hmm. Like this is the state right now. This is it is actually a document, and in ten twenty years, you could go back and watch this and be like, this is what it was like at the turn of that decade. Yeah. Before the next, you know, video game consoles came out. Um, there, at one point, very early on, I thought the movie would just be let's pick four of these video game stores and follow them for two years, and that's the film. There's a great movie, and I've probably brought it up on this show before, uh, called The American Scream. Yes. Yeah. It is a fantastic movie about Fairhaven, Massachusetts, and these families that turn their front and backyards into haunted houses every October. And it's about four or five of them. And I, I've watched the movie about five times, and it just destroys me. I love that movie. It is so warm and funny and sometimes heartbreaking. I was initially modeling not for resale after that film. And then I thought, you know, this, I can't avoid the technical mumbo jumbo in this movie. And I think it's worth talking about. And once I realized I could get the library of Congress to agree to be in my movie, mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of had to go for that. I kind of had to splinter off. There is a diamond shaped narrative though. You do revisit certain stores and certain stores certainly get more coverage than others. So Neil Crockett specifically is is the, kind of the bookend of the movie. Yeah, you'll see why when you watch the documentary. He's really charming, especially if you like New England accents. Yeah, I, I think yeah, like when we screened it in Boston, everybody loved him. He was there for the screening, right? and I don't think people knew in the theater. Yeah, which is great. No, they so didn't. at the end, like, there are moments towards the end of that movie where people were, like literally were cheering and clapping for him. Mm -hmm. The initial cut of the movie was almost three hours. I knew it wasn't going to be a three hour movie because, you know, 90 minutes is kind of the sweet spot. A lot of documentaries are like 70 minutes. Yeah. And um, I, I aim for 90 and it's 86. No, I'm glad you brought up the Library of Congress before because I'm guessing a lot of people listening to this don't know yet. And you will when you watch the movie, but they don't know yet. The Library of Congress even has a video game section. A lot of people don't know what the Library of Congress is. <laughs> that's unfortunately true. Yeah. Now that you say it out loud, that's true. Uh, the Library of Congress section was 
in what we got to see depicted conspicuously small when you consider how big a catalog of a lot of things of books of oh you're talking oh i thought you meant the section of the film you mean literally the library of congress's collection of video games their video game section Mm -hmm. exactly in within the context of the whole library yeah well we already know the answer to this question what can fix that money (laughs) well okay so fix that so there's a scene in the movie where yeah we go to the library of congress we meet david gibson who is basically the federal government's video game collection expert Mm -hmm. and uh he was a great guy to work with uh open book um made plenty of time for us great interview funny guy the great arc the arc of the history of video games in america is held by this guy this is the guy he's doing his job yeah and it's an awesome building that he's uh, the packard campus which is where we go in the film and uh he brings up it's not just funding um, a lot of organizations, a lot of filmmakers, artists will send in copies of their work to the Library of Congress when they're done. They'll go, okay, here's, uh, here's Frozen 2. They'll send in like a, like a 35 millimeter print or a DCP hard drive or what have you and go, here you go. We want the government to keep this safe in a bunker underground because that's literally what that building is. Video game publishers don't really do that. A few of them do, like Insomniac Games does it, mm-hmm. the company that makes Ratchet and Clank and uh, Resistance and uh, Spyro the Dragon. But um, a lot of other companies don't. If there was a corporeal like totem, like a, a like a, an artifact of like, okay, here is what this video game is. It's this static piece of art. Put it in a vault. You know, more of them would be held on record and kept safe. Yeah. But that's just not the way things are anymore. And it's not because of greed it's because entertainment is more living and breathing and dynamic than ever before we the three of us were playing dreams before we started this podcast which is a brand new video game as of this week and you can't make an archive of that game it's youtube for video games it's like mario maker or little big planet it's it's even beyond that because it's a proprietary format yeah which maybe the makers of the game or maker of makers of the platform are able to save these you know creator yeah. created games yeah uh, but there's no way for us as you know players to save them to local hard drives and revisit them in 20 years right yeah like that'd be like saying okay i want to go to a building where youtube is kept exactly <laughs> like what? <laughs> what do you mean like every like literally every hour yeah. youtube is different well i do have a question um yeah uh the uh, i forget i forget his name now the the library of congress david gibson david gibson he may have talked to you about this but do they have source code for any games yes and, yeah they actually even have printed out punch cards. Yes. Wow. You see it briefly in the movie for some of these old games, which is insane. Um, like they, they have everything from like five and a quarter floppies and things mm-hmm. like that from some of the oldest video games. Which that was pretty cool. Yeah, because like stuff like uh, like Zork, you could probably just print out on like 100 pieces of paper and hold the entire source code for the game. right? Yep. Um, so like why not archive games that are open source like that? Yeah. There are a few articles out there. Uh, David Gibson, years ago, was sent a copy of an unfinished Duke Nukem game for PSP Mm -hmm. that the developers realized they weren't going to be able to finish it. And the game was mostly done. So they just sent over what they had, like their dev kit version of the game. Said, here you go. We want to keep this somewhere on record. David Gibson just has this like unfinished Duke Nukem game that never came to be. And there's been a bunch of interviews about it. Like that's the kind of thing that is awesome to see I, every, pop up. Yeah, I just, there's a shot of him like ex- explaining how like the storage lockers work. They're, they're almost like giant bookcases that slide left and right and you yeah. seal them shut like with like a get smart contraption. Yeah. And it's such a cool visual and like thing to think about. Like this represents like preserving history. This know? is how you do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's really cool. It's one of the few times in, I think in the movie where you kind of see the, uh, like um, there's some PC big boxes in there. Yep. Uh, which is my nost- personal nostalgia. Well, yeah, you're um, a big PC gamer. Yeah. Well, yeah, I grew you up. Used to, well, especially when you were a kid. Yeah. When I was a kid, yeah, we did not we'd have consoles, but my dad, being a programmer, always had PC games, and we had a lot of shareware stuff, and yeah. we, we bought the big boxes, which is especially something that you don't find anymore. Even games that do get box releases, they're smaller boxes. They don't have any, uh, like, giant, you know, thick manuals. In and they them, frequently like they just contain to. a code. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's 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 almost like it's a symbolic representation of the game at this point to own it physically. Yeah. Uh, but back in the day, you know, you could, especially back in the '80s when things were all text adventures and stuff, like they would include like elaborate maps and like magnifying glasses, the code discs, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, it looks like you just got this floppy disk with our game on it, which doesn't necessarily mean you paid for. It. 
<laughs> but yeah, that's all dead now. <laughs> we kind of glossed over this. Neil, you uh, scored most of the movie. I, yes. Yeah, I, yeah, I did. So, well, first mention the other musicians who also contributed. Yeah, so we got this like murderer's row lineup of uh, musicians and composers. So Neil here did most of like the traditional score of the movie. I did 36 minutes of Yeah. yeah. But we also got music licensed from Time Cop 1983. Just a ba- yeah, a band you've been talking about for years. I yeah. love Time Cop. Uh, Jordy uh, is this fantastic synthwave artist. I've seen him twice now. Highly recommend Time Cop. Um, he was on board for the project. He was very cooperative. Uh, we got a few of his songs in the movie. Um, I also have uh, a few songs from a fellow named Griebel Sanchez. Uh, also does synthwave. Mm-hmm. Uh, very young. <laughs> yeah. um, not not as well known as Time Cop 1983, but he's great. Um, the Midnight, which is just like, I think, like the premier synthwave act. They are fantastic. They're uh, cool. I they're like really that. cool. You're so into synthwave that I literally like... I need to make my, I, I need to, <laughs> I, I occasionally in my score decided like, I'm going to make this bass sound like a synth wave bass just for Kevin. Yeah. You know? And, and, and uh, the Midnight song we got was a song called America 2, um, which is just about basically starting over and modern day America and finding your place and, you know, that running away springsteen undertone. And we got to license that for the trailer. It's not in the movie proper, mm-hmm. but it, uh, it really encapsulated the tone we were going for. And of course, uh, we had a few other uh, friends working on it. Uh, my buddy Matt DeMello, uh, who's out in New York City, he uh, did a song for the New Jersey store. Um, I just thought he could speak to the themes of uh, digital press video games in Clifton, New Jersey. He used piano and guitar, and it just fit the store like a glove. Nothing else in the movie sounds like that. Yeah. But uh, you were kind of like the glue that held the whole score together in a way, because there, there are all these desperate elements. There's like rock and roll music, there's synth wave music. Yeah. Um, but you were kind of like, yeah, like the connecting tissue. Yeah, it was, uh, we went about it in a fun way because I had no idea how much music I was going to end up writing for it. Yeah. I was just kind of like, yeah, send me a, a clip every now and then and I will, you know, spend a, a couple nights, you know, putting the, the song together. I'll send it to you and then you send me some notes back or tell me if this instrument doesn't work for you and then yeah. I'll do a second pass. And that's pretty much how it, how it all worked. None of it was... None of it was like uh, exactly like uh, bending over backwards to try and get it to fit the visuals because there's a lot of talking over it. So I didn't worry exactly about <laughs> it being too repetitive or being too quiet or anything. Yeah. Um, and it all ended up being about 36 minutes by the end of the production cycle. And it was all really different music for me. Uh, I, I tend to do quick pop songs and stuff. And yeah. this was more uh, atmospheric beds yeah. for, for scenes. Which is tough because you don't want it to be like this like homogenized, monotonous room tone like Minecraft music, which can be pleasing, <laughs> you know? Did you someone that was the one negative uh comment I've gotten so far on the YouTube was someone said it was Minecraft music. <laughs> Well, you have a tough road to hoe because you, you're trying not to interrupt the talking. And it's, yeah. There's like, it's there's a lot of talking. It's a mm-hmm. documentary. There's not a lot of like action. I mean, there, there are scenes where people aren't speaking and you're watching things go down. And I also brought on Dylan Wheaton uh, from Kingston, Massachusetts, another Kingston boy. Mm-hmm. He did some music for the movie as well. Like Matt DeMello, he did some acoustic guitar work that just made for a much better bed for certain scenes. You know, because the two major themes of the movie are technology, of course, video games, which you... Ex- you know, obviously, like, the synth stuff writes itself. I, d- I didn't want overbearing, super retro, dated-sounding synth. I wanted the modern synth wave aesthetic that mm-hmm. Time Cop could provide in you in the midnight. But the other major theme being this earthy, human, brick-and-mortar, blue-collar, mom-and-pop store, going into business story angle that I thought acoustic guitar worked very well for. Yeah. So it's peppered throughout, and you had to sort of be the connective tissue and the glue between all of these I'm desperate not, elements. Yeah, well, I'm not a big uh, acoustic guitar guy, but uh, yeah, the music I wrote, I, I figured, well, I can do video game-ish music, but yeah. if you want it to sound a little different, I opted to go with the Sega Genesis style of, of um, that sound chip, which is a little more glassy and bell-sounding at times. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I tried to incorporate a lot of that. I was also... Uh, I'm, I'm gearing up to do another different soundtrack that's going to include a lot of, you know, realistic orchestral um, 
patches basically. Yeah. I, I don't have access to a real orchestra, but I, I had just, you know, um, gotten my hands on a lot of those sounds and I was like, I'm going to incorporate a little bit of that yeah. into the, into this score to, to give it a more grand feeling at times. I'm so um, glad you were able to release the score separate from the movie too, mm, because yeah. it's really fun just to put on and listen to. You really get to hear the whole soundscape with your versus like when it's below the sounds of like, you know, people picking up video game cartridges yeah. and talking about them at conventions and the, like in the movie. Yeah, so I did actually go back uh, for releasing the soundtrack separately. I fixed up a lot of the the, the sounds and stuff that I uh, uh, wasn't happy listening to on their own. They sound fine in the documentary because people was talking over it and um, and all that. But you're, you're thinking you might go in later and, and fix it up a little bit or yeah, replace. Cool. That's the whole thing about this movie, right? Is that ironically, I can go in and mm-hmm. improve the cut of the movie on Vimeo or Amazon Video On Demand without anyone being the wiser. I mm-hmm. just update the mezzanine file in the back end and it gets pushed out to you. Mezzanine file. I love that. that I've never yeah, heard yeah, that yeah. before. But the Blu-ray version that's out there is that's it. That's the first pressing. That's the first edition version of that movie. And it, that's, that's the one it's always going to be. No one will care. Yes. But you know <laughs> no, what I'm people, saying? Yeah. But people that, actually like that. I mean, people oh, yeah. who saw cats before they updated the special effects are like, that's the version they want to keep. They want to have access Wayne's to that. world when it was first put in theaters, the stairway to heaven scene. I don't know if you know about this, but I don't. in Wayne's world, there's a scene where Wayne looks at a guitar at a stairway store, and he starts Denied. playing stairway to heaven. And then someone goes like, Hey, and points to a sign and it says no stairway. stairway. The theatrical version of the movie, he actually plays the first few it's, notes of stairway right. to heaven but a lawsuit was threatened at them and they had to change the like three notes he played Yeah, to not be, but things like that do happen. That's way more common than you think with theatrical to video, like even, you know, like Star Wars. Or improving special thing. effects yeah. in movies and remastering them for 1080 or 480p. Whatever. There's a lot of actually like Mandela effects uh, surrounding that where people remember something differently happening in the movie. Ghostbusters and then they go back 2 and had check. a different ending in the European version of the film and there was no public record of it, yeah. but a lot of people saw it. Slimer flew around the uh, Statue of Liberty. A yeah. bunch of people like, well, like remember a it, lot of people have talked about it, but there's like no someone, no, there's no like 35 millimeter print of the European version of the movie. That That's shows crazy. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I digress. Uh, <laughs> no, I, 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 I'd love it if you could get the uh, new versions of the, the score in there. At some I will point. likely do that. That'd be cool. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, so I, I think I talked about this. We, we've had a few stops and starts in this recording session, but I, incorporated uh, orchestral sounds into the soundtrack a little bit to kind of um, acquaint myself with those particular, you know, um, sound plugins because I'm going to be using them a lot in the future. And uh, so this was like a nice test run for that. And there's parts of the soundtrack where I use like these really big uh, like uh, French horn sounds. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you you came back and you said like, man, this is really Superman-ish, isn't it? Right? <laughs> I Well, because I – so – when I first cut the movie, I had a temp score, yeah. which a lot of like, that's like a very standardized thing to do. Tricky, and yeah. and some of the movie I used Hans Zimmer Man of Steel mm-hmm. uh, score, which I think is an amazing score. But obviously, the it wasn't like the big Superman march. It wasn't like no. the big like hero <laughs> themes of the movie. But when you came back to me with uh, your initial drafts of music, I got worried. I'm like, this sounds good, but it's like, are you comfortable going this route? Because it's almost like. Yeah, Superman or Blade Runner. It's like really good, but like this is very different. I didn't want to force your hand too hard to emulate Hans Zimmer. Yeah, no. Well, I, I specifically said like, please don't send me unless it unless it's unless it's like a tempo thing or just like a general drive thing. Uh, you know, I don't want to try and imitate any backing tracks. Yeah. Um, you know, beyond basic like functional. I want to be stuff. Neil Cicerega music. Yeah. So what I did was I just tried to tap into the emotional thrust that I felt watching the rough cut of the film, Great. which is there's something inherently sad about st- kind of staking your life on a dying industry in this way. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the music I wrote is way sadder than I thought it would be. Sometimes I kind of had to like go in and like make it a little more informative sounding. Um, but it, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's a lot of documentaries have this kind of feeling of melancholy, um, yeah, melancholy, bittersweet, uh, music and video game music can sound like that at times too. That's a lot of my my most yeah. positive memories of like old video game 
um, soundtracks, I always would pick up on the kind of sad sounding. Honestly, I brought it up earlier. Minecraft, yes. like Minecraft really has that like somber bed to most I of it. I haven't heard Minecraft music, but uh, really? the example I was thinking of was the, uh, the dire, dire docks from Mario 64, oh, yeah. which I, I deliberately <laughs> picked that like piano sound and sure. used it a few times. God, I love that song. Yeah. Everybody loves that song. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you're right. You're talking about something that's either exists right now or the history of it. Documentaries mm-hmm. by definition, yeah. either documenting finger on the pulse of something happening in the real world. This is a time capsule. This is a form of history or it's literally the history, the past. Mm -hmm. If we were pitching the future, it would just be an advertisement. It would not be a documentary. And this is not an ad. Yeah. We we try to tackle the subject of nostalgia in the movie because I I think it's a term that's overused when discussing retro video games to a point where it's becoming sort of meaningless on a lot of internet discourse. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm nostalgic for this. Okay, well, what do you mean? And uh, we even make a joke at someone's expense in the movie about the term nostalgia. But we do a whole five, six minutes on nostalgia because... Not the know, nostalgia critic, right? No, okay. no. But like, you know, it's yearning for something you... And we try. I try to show but not tell that this is the feeling you have for something you want but cannot have again. And yeah. drawing the parallels between the feeling you had when you played a video game when you were a kid with a certain person that maybe isn't available to you anymore. Mm -hmm. You just can't put your brain in that space anymore. I want to draw a parallel between that and this industry, like the, the mom and pop retro video game store industry. And it's, it's hard because I really didn't want to spell it out and bang people over the head with those kind of themes. And I got, I got real worried at points. Like, is this too heady? Oh no, no, it's great. But there's a segment (laughs) where Neil Crockett like nails the head nails the nail. Hits the nail on the head. Yeah, yeah. Hails, nails the head on the hit. You got it. I, got it. <laughs> I can cut the syllables together. It's fine. <laughs> um, leave it in. Many times in the documentary, in his really charming New Englandy way, like really says the thesis of the of the movie perfectly, which is why I think you focus on him a lot. Yeah. He, um, he says that you know he's selling your memories back to you. Yeah. You know he he talks about his own personal experiences of seeing people picking up a game, their eyes lighting up, and talking about some personal anecdote from their childhood or like describing their living room or that happens to him all the time all the time yeah he he, neil crockett implored me to do this and we didn't get to do it so he should be mad at me because i didn't do it but he kept telling me you got to just bring a camera into the store and i'm telling you just wait a full day on any october day when this store is packed you just ask people and they're going to tell you these stories and you could do like a whole montage of people. And I, I, I've seen it happen dozens of times when mm-hmm. people walk in and as I'll be talking to Neil behind the counter, they'll just scream out loud. Oh my God, you have this game. Oh my God. I remember when my dad brought this home on Easter. I remember my sister and I staying up all night to play this and they immediately buy it. And you know that I wanted that feeling to kind of be the like sort of like the tone of the whole film but not necessarily what the movie was about, you know? No, but like including that line is very smart because this kind of documentary, I I think what you're running up against is people who who might look down on the idea of a a video game store or or something like that, or nostalgia as being kind of empty or meaningless or just like trying to recapture something that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. And actually diving into like, like everybody does this, you know, everybody has memories and has reference points and it actually does mean something to them. And there's a reason that they will, you know, spend their money on it, you know. Yeah. And there remains a hurdle that we as a culture, we're getting better about it because <laughs> baby boomers are dying. No, we're getting better <laughs> about it in general. If I were to tell someone I want to reread a great novel I read in college, wouldn't even light wouldn't even turn yellow. Green light sounds great. Go for it. Dostoevsky, whatever. If I told them I want to replay the video game. I played the first summer that my brother got a job and he went away and I was alone for the first time in my life without a peer my own age or my own brother. That is such a, and they would say, but that's a video game. It's a Tamagotchi. And I go, no, it is a, an immersive experience. It is something I actively do. You passively watch television. You actively read a novel and you actively play a game. It's an experience that can never be quite the same again, but it is tied to those memories. Yeah, there's a whole thing with, like, a, like around a decade or so ago, it became a meme at a certain point, but people arguing and really fighting online for the legitimacy of video games. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, Gene, uh, Ro- Roger Ebert, like, you know, like, came out and basically said video games aren't art, and, like, it became yeah. a joke at a certain point because it's just so, he was factually wrong. 
Like yeah. it's not a subjective thing. And then, but like, you know, people online never compensated and started saying things like, Oh, well, our games art. Like you just heard it all the time and all these podcasts and stuff. Um, and of course they are like, what is the citizen Kane of video games became a big question. Um, yes. but thankfully it got annoying. <laughs> yeah. And, but in the last like 10, 12 years, we've had some great video game thought pieces come out, some great documentaries, for example, you know, we have things like King of Kong, which are super entertaining, but they are, they, they made people think about video games in a way they hadn't before. We take it for granted that we had things like chasing ghosts, you know, or, uh, but now there are documentaries coming out like the lost arcade, mm -hmm. which is not super popular, but I highly encourage people to look it up. It's available for free on Amazon prime. I really like the lost arcade. I think things like the Lost Arcade and hopefully not for resale can step on the shoulders of that work and deliver documentaries now that aren't just these like kind of broad tales of video games and get more into like subgenres of video games because vi video games are so big mm -hmm. topic wise. If someone told you, oh, I made a documentary about sports and it's 90 minutes and it's just sports, <laughs> what the hell would that even mean? You don't have to do that. You can make a Larry Bird documentary or like a documentary about one boxing match can be the whole film. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I want us to get there with video games culturally. And there are people out there making some great stuff regularly on YouTube and Vimeo, like, oh, yeah. the, like the, my life in gaming guys or Danny O'Dwyer with no clip and not for resales in this funny space where it's a dedicated feature film. I, I, I shot it with Tom and edited it the color and everything to feel like a feature film. Like this is a piece of cinema, but it's a weird space. Cause is there even room left for that <laughs> nowadays? Yeah. You know, like a dedicated like movie that you would spend money and rent. That's just about video game discussions. And uh, we had to do a lot of heavy lifting to get it to where it is uh, aesthetically speaking. Well, yeah, like the, the state of YouTube documentary is super interesting. A lot of it is, uh, it, it's not the case where they have a, a camera crew go into a physical location. Yeah. It's more about going through the history of something and maybe offering a little bit of critique or context to it yeah. in a way that you uh, wouldn't uh, just consuming it as a you know piece of nostalgia for yeah. that hit. Um, you got to sift through it to find things that aren't just, I'm going to read this Wikipedia article there's a lot and not that vet too. it. You've brought up the channel before, the guy who does the Nickelodeon. Uh, really good. Yeah, really good <laughs> example of that. Um, this guy... Um, pop arena. And there's a lot of YouTube channels that, that follow this, this formula, but he's going through every show that has aired on Nickelodeon, whether or not it was created for Nickelodeon or whether it was an old show. And he's in good faith going through the history of that show and the creators and what, uh, you know, what trends it's a part of and like doing just like an amazing amount of research on, uh, sometimes shows that don't exist anymore. There's on no tape. footage of yeah. some of these shows. Um, yeah, that's what YouTube is doing right now. And in yeah. some ways, it is blowing traditional documentaries out of the water. That's a type of journalism that requires labor, you yeah. know, and not just like, okay, well, I copy pasted this and now I'm going to rephrase it. Well, <laughs> at, at the end of each of his episodes, he's, he, he gives you some suggested reading, which is often like a, an entire book he found about like, you know, uh, you know, about the industry or about like the CEOs and stuff of, of this or that company and to do that with video games is also, you know, something that is starting to happen. Yes. And uh, that's a really good thing. But it's, it's a, it is a very uh, at-home type of research that you make. You know, all you really need is a microphone and, a, you know, editing suite and a lot of time to gather <laughs> materials. Yeah. Whereas uh, going to stores across the country and visiting, you know, and talking to people is a strength of the traditional documentary model, which is what you've done. Basically it took you a long ass time. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. We, I personally did every transcript of every interview. I didn't have the money to hire someone else to do it. So I had to listen to every interview and that's hundreds of hours of people talking. Oh shit. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, I could show you the Google drive file mm -hmm. of all the, yeah, I have a whole, I had a whole system ironed out and, uh, you know, people aren't going to be around forever. There's a reason they're called documentaries. <laughs> yes. We just wanted to bring new material material to the world and not recycle something that was already previously accessible and, you know, mm -hmm. just apply our lens to it. Let me ask you this, Kevin, and that huge Google doc through the Google drives of all the transcripts of all these interviews, yeah. is that something that you might eventually share publicly long after the people have had access, had the ability to access the film or is there too much like 
personal stories, sensitive material in there that you maybe you wouldn't that the people involved may not necessarily want to be shared. I wouldn't share the transcripts because there's a lot of like chicken scratch Kevin James notes. Okay. Like a lot of probably typos and stuff that I didn't have time to go back. Cause I would play the interviews back at full speed when I was doing this. And I'm not like a stenographer. Mm -hmm. I definitely want to put more of the interviews out there. There's one shop in particular, Lost Ark Video Games in Greensboro, North Carolina, that um it's a shame it's not covered more in the movie. Mm -hmm. I think what's in the movie is gorgeous, and there's some great stuff from the owner, Dan McMillan. You know, I definitely want to release more interviews from the movie at some stage, whether it's on Vimeo for people who've purchased and rented the movie as like a feature you can only get there. Um, it could also just be, we just, I have no idea. I honestly don't know. A lot, yeah. At every store you went to, every brick and mortar store that you and Tom set up lights and cameras and microphones, you got tons of material, yeah. all of which had to fit down to 90 minutes. Yeah. 86, actually. Yeah. So we just lost four. <laughs> <laughs> so every store you went to has to have some great stuff that you ha has to have gold that you had to cut. Yeah. Now that we're in a podcast and it's a lot less work <laughs> than everything else you had to put together, I yeah. want to learn about Marcus Richardson. Yeah. His store was really interesting. We learn about him. We learn about the unnamed bike club that was next door. <laughs> Tell me a little more about Marcus Richardson's store that we didn't get to see on screen. So uh, Marcus works at 8 Bidden Up Video Games in Manhattan, New York. And he let Thomas and I come by to interview him. And the day we came by, it was pouring rain out. You look at him and uh, during his interview, you can he's wearing a white t-shirt and you can see like he's soaked. Mm -hmm. Marcus was running late for a hockey game he really wanted to go to. Um, it doesn't come off on screen. He was being very nice about everything. Uh, but the store was across the street from a Hells Angels club. I figured that, it that was, was that. infamous. Uh, but we were asked by a few people, like, don't mention the Hells Angels because you might. Are they very litigious? No, they'll start crap with people. Really? Uh, yeah. They're, yeah, they like fight people and stuff. Like, and they were literally across the street from this video game store. And like, they had kind of a tenuous relationship with the video game store. But then they eventually became customers of the shop. Nice. Since my documentary has been made, that club was shut down by the city. Hmm. <laughs> ah. Yeah, Marcus had some great stories. I don't want to spoil them because they're in the movie. But uh, Marcus, you know, learned how to repair PlayStation consoles early on in his life. And he got to apply it to that store. Marcus is great. He's super funny and welcoming. And uh, he couldn't believe we finished the movie. He told me, oh, yeah, so many people come through with cameras and film stuff. And they go, I'm making a movie. I'm making a movie. And when... Tom and I surprised him. We came back to the store not that long ago with Blu-rays in hand and we handed it to Marcus. Like, here's a copy of the Blu-ray and Marcus is on the packaging. He lost his mind. <laughs> he was so excited. Like, you guys actually finished it and it's real? Like, because there's like yeah, a UPC code there. and plastic crap. Like, is this like a real Blu-ray? Like, I didn't take you for a... <laughs> you guys looked like rubes. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, but to go back a, a, a couple of seconds, I mean, like a lot of these stores aren't going to be around forever. None of them are actually, but I mean, some of them have closed already Yeah, and the more material you can release documenting, documenting these stores, these places are going to be memories for a lot of people and they are going to want to go back and see what it was like. And yeah. yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. I've something I've noticed uh, trying to find information about like a store that I used to go to as a kid, that sort of thing is not preserved in any way, especially on the internet. Yes. Um, you can't even find like what was at a certain address at a certain year. There's no way to look that information up. You know, um, so Kingston, Massachusetts, the hometown of the three of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know where the train tracks are? Yeah, yeah. And like the epicenter of Kingston. There used to be a bookstore. I think it was called like Half Moon. It was like a children's bookstore. Yes. Mm. And it was not open that long, but the sign for the bookstore was up for like 15, 20 years. I don't think it's there anymore, but no. every time I drive by it, I think of that bookstore. And it's, I think it's just storage now for like a, like a garage or something like that. No, I've definitely looked up that bookstore and I can't find anything on it anywhere on the internet. It's yeah, that's that that particular topic is very hard. The smaller the town, even in even in Boston, like yeah. I, I I've tried to find like what was this store before this? Um, I, like you know, I see an old sign, yeah, like for for that, and try to try to look it up, and there's just no information. Yeah. So it is nice to have a documentary that actually documents a brick and mortar places that won't be around forever, and people might be curious about. Yeah, I agree. No, that, 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 that thought really hadn't crossed my mind, but the, the whole documenting and getting you an inside look at something that you might not otherwise get to do certainly was definitely like at the front of my mind when making the movie. I treated the stories these people had as kind mm -hmm. of like the unshown um, 
evidence, like the, like the things that maybe weren't going to ever make it out unless we made a movie about them. Yeah. Um, that was sort of like the way I went about it. But you're right. Like getting to go inside and explore these spaces. Uh, I don't know. It makes it a document. Yeah. <laughs> which well, I that, keep coming back is, to. Yeah. That is kind of the other half of the movie, which is about preserving media. Yes. And we haven't even talked about uh, like Frank Cifaldi. We talked about, you know, the uh, Library of Congress a bit. But um, yeah. there is a lot of talk about how digital games are so much harder to preserve. Because of living and breathing. Yeah, we yeah. talked about dreams. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, we'll tell you what, Kevin, here's a, a short question with sure. a long answer. <laughs> tell the audience at home a little bit about Frank Cifaldi. Oh, Frank Cifaldi. Jeez. Th- this guy runs the Video Game History Foundation out in California. Uh, he's also a video game director and publisher uh, at Digital Eclipse. He worked on uh, the Mega Man Legacy Collection, the Disney Afternoon Collection. He directed the Sharknado video game. What? And he <laughs> had very him. little time. He's also, uh, not to disbar- it's not, that's not a disparaging remark. He's got some good stories about the hell he went through making that. But Frank Cifaldi um, used to work at 1UP, which when I was in college was my favorite video game news outlet. And um, I reached out to him to get him involved in the movie because I thought he could speak to the major themes of the movie, the major subject matters, like, okay, like preservation and like the impact of digital distribution on physical media and small businesses and um, the doors it opens up. And I knew he'd be very pragmatic. He is not a nostalgic person. Frank is a very forward thinking guy. Mm-hmm. And I, it was so hard not to just have him narrate the damn movie. Yeah. Uh, when I was editing the film, I was like, this guy just gets everything across so succinctly. He's a much better speaker than me. No, no he's, he's, he's really good in the documentary. I followed him because of the documentary. I was like, oh, this guy really gets it. Like, this he, guy gets it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's very funny, too. You should follow him on Twitter, Frank Cifaldi. But no, I knew we had to have him in the movie. Um, he has a great cat that didn't make it into the movie, but the cat hung out with us on set while we were filming at his place. Um, but yeah, look up the Video Game History Foundation. They do great work. Uh, they work with uh, game developers in museums around the country doing exactly what you think they do. They work on preserving the history of video games and finding unreleased games that never made it to market, like SimCity for the NES. Ooh, yeah, yeah, like, huh. I mean, Frank has a history of working with other people like him to outbid collectors on eBay to get rare video games and release them to the public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All that stuff. Yeah, he's making fun of uh, Palmer Lucky right now, uh, mm-hmm. who's a dirtbag, and is trying to buy the Nintendo PlayStation. I saw I saw that trending recently on yeah. Twitter. I was like, like that's, yeah. Ryan and I saw one of the rare still it's existing. It's the same one. It's that one. The one Ryan and I got to touch at MagFest, Magfest years yeah. ago. We got to touch it. We literally said, can we just touch this thing? And the owner was like, yeah, sure. So Ryan and I literally just like put our fingertips on it. Like, okay, cool. Uh, we Thanks, were at man. MagFest to screen computer your fighters. Your back in your head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Frank Cifaldi's wonderful. Look him up. Look up the Video Game History Foundation. He does great work there. He did a great TED Talk, too. Or has he done a couple by now? I don't know if he's on TED Talk. He's done, like... Something like... Oh, he did the GDC talk you're talking about. Yes. Yeah, he's spoken at GDC a few times. He makes real irrefutable arguments about archiving source code for games, about how many games have been lost. And not... so, to some people who really don't care about video games, they might be rolling their eyes like, okay, well, who cares about losing source code? It's like, well, some of the most important pieces of entertainment from the 90s and 2000s were video games. Like Silent Hill 2, the source code was lost. And Silent Hill 2 is amazing. Uh, so to play Silent Hill 2, you need to emulate somehow a PlayStation 2, which is very hard to do with perfect accuracy. Very hard to do. I still have a copy of Silent Hill 2 if I want to play it. But Frank Cifaldi will tell you in his TED Talk-like discussions at GDC that Uncle Buck is available in like nine, ten different formats. <laughs> you can get it on UMD and BCD and Blu-ray and DVD and Beta. Silent Maybe Hill. even a laser disc. But Who you knows? can't get Silent Hill 2? <laughs> like, yeah. what's going on? Like, you know. So that, like, yeah, he's, he's a great advocate for a very pragmatic, uh, ubiquitously accessible type of preservation. Yeah. And he goes to bat for um, uh, video game pirates a lot, too, or specifically Because they're the only people doing the work. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And a lot of that involves, you know, dumping games and, and, uh, and finding interesting things out that you wouldn't find out unless you could, you know, see the ROM file and all that. I'm well, manipulating the art of video games 
manipulating the code of video games is how you frequently find initial and original intent of the creators. Like mm -hmm. there was a huge lawsuit, the hot coffee mod for Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Are you both familiar with this? I remember yep. that. Yeah. That wasn't available in the commercial game. It was in the code for the game, but you had to modify the game to access it, which raised all sorts of technical questions people in the government weren't equipped to answer. But the end of that story became, hey, Rockstar, you need to literally delete these files from the disc. So they had to make a new printing of the game. It didn't have that code in there. Um, but things like that, more innocent things like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have come up in Frank's research and what they're doing at the Video Game History Foundation. Like, uh, But yeah, read up on him. Yeah, he, yeah. he could speak to it much better than I ever. It's a really interesting world that's only kind of touched on in your documentary, but it's yeah. worth, worth bringing up in case that interests yeah. you. Rewatching the movie last night, while Frank, one of the many times Frank is discussing the subject of video games and yeah. video game preservation, he talks about his concern, his fear for content being algorithm, algorithmically, that's a good Scrabble word, mm -hmm. yeah. being algorithmically determined based on likes and things, content you've already consumed. He's concerned about content being predetermined algorithmically for young people, that they won't have the opportunities to discover these things on their own. Yeah. While he's discussing these kinds of problematic algorithms, we, or rather, we the audience, but you, Kevin James, the director and editor, depict a young child looking through his iPad with these big Disney Mickey Mouse headphones on, blocking out all the other sounds around him. Anything to say there? No comment. Excellent. <laughs> but I'm glad you picked up on that. Because uh, yeah. that, yes, that was a conscious decision. I... I have a young child and um, first of all, pe people who are, are concerned that, oh, a kid knows how to use a touch screen that says more about touch screens than it does about kids. Yep. The first time my daughter saw a touch screen, she kind of figured it out. They're just that easy. That's, that's touch screens intuitive. are consumption devices. Yeah. Yeah. My experience in occasionally letting, you know, like letting, letting her watch a YouTube video that I haven't pre-screened or something like that is there's a lot of garbage out there and it just floats right to the, first results yep. in the, in the, in the, in, you know, your search and Spider-Man and Elsa get married, not that stuff so much anymore, but like content farm stuff that is like not very well made and like just doesn't instill a whole lot of trust in purple hippo, yellow hippo. They all make a noise. I guess it's teaching counting, but not really. What, what are you talking about? Neil? like toy commercials? And no, stuff? I'm talking about YouTube videos and the content that's out there and yeah. the content that gets promoted and has like far more views than anything we'll ever make will ever have. And it's just, it's just like weird and not very well made. And, yeah. um, it's targeted for very young children. Yeah. And, and YouTube, I think has made a lot of changes recently to try and combat this. And like a lot of the, when you go to upload to YouTube now, it specifically asks like, is this for kids? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And we've had to go through all our videos and like check, like, no, it's not specifically made for kids. So no, don't yeah. show it to kids. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it, it has changed. A lot of the weird Spider-Man, Elsa, like legitimately disturbing stuff, I think does not show up anymore. Yeah. So yeah, um, people like Frank, you know, talking about the algorithm and uh, how it's it should not apply to children like that has actually had an effect yeah. Um, well, but at, at that point somewhat, in the movie, yeah. I wanted to get into like consumerism as a whole mm -hmm. and um, not just the value of a curated library that a store provides in the familiarization, like, like a store owner can read you and figure out what you like and don't like and recommend something that's there too, for sure. But um, taking people completely out of the equation is, you know, that's what you get. You get Spider-Man and Elsa get married, this automatically generated animation that gets put on a content farm platform like YouTube that mm -hmm. kids are going to be forced, not forced, but uh, served up versus, you know, flipping through like 20 channels on TV and like, okay, I guess I'll watch Gilligan's Island. And <laughs> I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't want to necessarily uh, like raise our childhood as, as like the, as the premier yeah. uh, example of like how children should be educated because we got a lot of, garbage commercials and like downright predatory one nine hundred numbers and stuff were that still was around a little before we our kids. time though. it was yeah but it was it was like the, if you're gonna look back to the 80s as being a better time for kids you have to acknowledge that like oh a lot of a lot of the laws we have on the books now are because 
people saw dollar signs in the 80s with, um, you know, the children of boomers, basically. Yeah. Hey, this cartoon looks like it was made just to sell toys. Well, yes. Yes, it was. Okay, that's not good. We can't do that. We can't make, yeah. Yeah. They gave me some putting hours and hours of content into kids' brains that teach them just to buy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of two steps forward, one step back with that stuff. And uh, yeah, we definitely need to be vigilant today. I want you to have the display for this brand of cigarettes close to the door so the kids steal them. Then when they're addicted, they start to buy our brand. That's monstrous. <laughs> then why'd you say it? <laughs> well, I didn't do it. <laughs> uh, no, I have you on tape, Ryan. So. <laughs> you, Kevin, you talk about a lot of different subjects, about human stories, about the stores, about the nature of small businesses, and about the great way that these things are preserved and can be consumed and enjoyed in the future. There's one particular story, a very 21st century story. I'd love for you could t- tell us a little bit about the story of Rocket League. Oh my God, Rocket! I mean, everyone knows Rocket League, right? It's like this super popular video game that came out 2014. I want to guess. Um, it originally launched as a freebie on PlayStation Plus, which helped propel it to fame. Um, it didn't hurt that it was also a fantastic game to explain and play. It was, it's basically soccer with cars, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to incorporate it into my film because it's a clear cut example of digital distribution providing the means for success. That game would not have been a success if you had to go to a store and spend 50 bucks on it, let alone 60. Even if that game was discounted to 40 bucks brand new day of, oh, yeah. that game, the fact that you could just turn it on and download it within five minutes and boom, the game's there. It made for a great example of that type of success. And there are other games, obviously, that that are as successful that only blew up because of digital, you know, things like, um, you know, Fortnite and you know Minecraft and all that. But the big thing about Rocket League, and it's just complete luck, was that a friend of mine from Fitchburg State College, Devin Connors, works at Psyonix, the company that makes Rocket League, mm-hmm. and he works in marketing for them. So not only could he help me get interviews, but he could vet like what we could and could not talk about. He made it very easy. <laughs> so thank you very much, Devin. <laughs> Fun anecdote there. Devin Connors also went to college with me. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, Neil. <laughs> I didn't go to Devin's in your college. <laughs> Thank you, Devin. Yeah, um, if you haven't played Rocket League, go play it. It's awesome. It's on everything. Yeah. It's a really good game. Yeah, no, that works. It's like a, it's a good, good thing to put in the documentary. Is that like, oh, things aren't digital. Physical media is dying because digital because there is a solid, understandable reason to move over to digital, and you have to explain that and show that. Like, yeah, we no, did not want to vilify digital distribution. Yeah, yeah. yeah that that would have been too. Uh, too much antiquity there. Yeah, yeah. Too much Ludditism. <laughs> <laughs> Word we don't use enough. We could talk ad nauseum about this. Kevin has thought about it for hundreds of days and thousands of hours. And it is a perfect film. <laughs> yes. It is really, it's just like not a frame I'd change about it. It's a 10 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> but the no, best that, thing- that is the one thing we actually have not talked about is the actual filmmaking and, and shot planning a little bit. Okay, yeah. Um, might be worth it to just talk about this a little bit. Yeah. The the film is very pretty, um, and I know you put a lot of great care into making sure that it wasn't just run and gun all the time. Yeah. Obviously, sometimes you were constrained, but... Yeah, sometimes we would only have five hours at a store, mm-hmm. and that store is in the movie, and we had to get an interview, footage, good audio, yeah, gear in and out with two men and a rental car. And that move that, that that happened very frequently. A lot of the things in the movie were from that road trip. Um, What's your ideal day of shooting, though? Uh, an ideal day of shooting would be at least four people on the crew. Mm-hmm. Um, we would get there before the store opens, um, ideally an hour and a half before, so we can build up everything. If the owner is generous enough with their time, we can start their interview before they open. And the great thing about video game stores is if they open at 10 a.m., their customers aren't showing up at 10 a.m. They're probably going to show up around (laughs) noon, right? And then we just do our interview first. Then we go into B-roll mode while there's people in the store. So we can, you know, open up the iris and uh, get some bouquet action, get some soft focus. So you see people shopping in the background while we're getting our uh, nice dolly shots and inserts of the games on the shelves, unique things, the architecture of the building. What makes that store unique from the other stores, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And then maybe we get a second interview with a customer at the store or the owner again. I I really like getting the verite, you know, slice of life moments where people are like behind the counter talking to their customers or, oh, wait a minute, you got to see this cool thing because they don't think about these things when they're on microphone. You always have your best ideas when you're not being recorded. 
So if we shoot the interview first and then go into B-roll mode and they come back at me with, oh, man, you got to see. I, I have an old uh, uh, Pokemon Snap machine, actually. Yeah. That's the ideal workflow, you know. And also, if we get a full day of shooting in, we could take a lunch break in the middle, which is nice. <laughs> Speaking of which. <laughs> so, yeah, if we talk much longer, I yeah. mean, there will be nothing left to talk about, I think. But uh, <laughs> you should, there's plenty in the movie that's like very specific and, and very nice. And it's a really pleasant and informative and uh, touching documentary, especially for something about you know, something like video game stores, which you wouldn't expect to be as, you know, as kind of dreamlike at times, I guess. Yeah. It's all on Amazon Prime, as I as I said before. And um, uh, what's the uh, Twitter handle? Game Store Doc. Yes. Check out the Twitter. Give that a follow. Yeah. If you want to watch it in 4K or download it, it's mm -hmm. on Vimeo, too. Yes. It's cheaper than Amazon. Nice. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> don't give your money to Amazon. <laughs> yeah. So honestly, we would encourage y'all to go to www.gamestoredoc.com. Dot com. Yep. That's D-O-C. Uh, we're going to take a short break right now. We're going to continue the podcast and take some of your questions from Patreon. It'll be real great. Man, I never get tired of that fucking song. Well, we're back <laughs> with the final segment of our podcast. Ryan, what are we doing? Well, we got some questions from the patrons. Yep. Over at patreon.com slash guaranteed video or guaranteedvideo.com guaranteedaudio.com where you can find our stuff. We only take questions on our podcast from patrons and we have a few we've selected from a couple dozen that were given to us but I think we picked four. Ian T. McFarlane wrote, would you rather watch the Sonic movie that was released or the one where Sonic looks like a real weirdo? Five points for using the word weirdo. Yeah, we yes. love that. This one. Like the weirdo thing's funny but this reminds me that, you know, obviously other Sonic things are going to be in this movie like yeah. knuckles and tails probably maybe i want to see what the hell they looked like before yeah believe it or not this movie is out now we haven't seen it yet we yeah. have not. it's been out for more than a day i think ryan and i might see it after you take off <laughs> <laughs> so um my answer is that yes objectively it is a better looking cgi puppet now but i there's something sick inside me that wants to watch the original version <laughs> i think the trailer is kind of the best case scenario right because just like, i would feel guilty if people had to make that whole movie with that model they only had made the trailer apparently yeah that's true yeah but i want the concept art to leak i want to see what tails and knuckles look like <laughs> they will actually get people to buy this blu-ray if they just release here's the original version here's our character designs yeah tell the story of the sonic redesign because this is kind of unprecedented material this has never it never happened at least this publicly honestly i'd love more movies to include uh work prints and like previs sequences yeah. honestly one of the nice things i'm going to say about disney plus is uh and and the star wars prequels is uh, i think one of them has or a couple of them have in the deleted scene se sections, uh, like they have previs stuff and it's hilarious. It's like a Tim and Eric skit. They have like <laughs> yeah, stock Venus. explosions moving around and like, like really bad CGI yeah. characters moving around. It's like really funny. And it's just like a bunch of like adults playing star Wars in their mm -hmm. backyard. That's what it really looks like. Yeah. 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 It looks like a fan film. Yeah. It's just like almost like stream of consciousness effects, yeah. like temporary work, like where there's like, Really no, I don't know, it's side sideline, but yeah, like I love seeing unfinished versions of movies. Well, Mr. McFarlane, I know the Sonic that just looks like how Sonic is supposed to look is going to be a better movie. We did not waste people's time and energy. Okay, it has all been an enormous waste of time and energy. <laughs> but here's my answer that I have said several times in my real life as a civilian, but I've never said here in a recording. Dr. Robotnik turns animals into robots. That's his gimmick. That's his shtick. I want, at some point in this film, I have not seen yet, and I'm never going to get my wish, but that's fine. <laughs> Maybe in like some weird meme in the future, or a meme right now before I'm even done with this recording, where Sonic is captured by Dr. Robotnik. Whoa! He gets put in a robot, roboticizing machine. That's his gimmick. That's what he does. And... His friends, whether it be Tails or Knuckles or a human, it doesn't matter. James Marsden doesn't matter. Get him out. And in the process, while he was being roboticized, he becomes, 
He doesn't quite get there, but he becomes the horrible pre-Sonic, and we have to just live oh, like with that the for the yeah. next movie. I as a big fuck you to this awful fan base. I haven't seen anything online about them making a joke about it in the movie because they'd already filmed principal photography was long done. Right. And I know they didn't do reshoots because that wouldn't be worth it, but it's a shame that there's probably not going to be a wink in this movie about that. There's like a scene where he like walks by a funhouse mirror. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. There you go. It's it's like when Godzilla, a a modern version of Godzilla fights the Matthew Broderick 1998 Godzilla and he just wipes the floor with him in a second. Which movie is that? We're like, this is Godzilla 2000? That sounds right. Something like that. One of like, of those? this guy is trash, and if you actually love these kaiju movies, then like, this, fuck this. This is a mistake. <laughs> All right, I, time Next, to move yeah, on. Yeah. We've spent enough time on Sonic the Hedgehog. We had discussions before recording this podcast about we can't talk about Sonic again. No, because we've done like two and a half episodes about yeah, Sonic yeah. the Hedgehog at this <laughs> point. And now the movie's out. Let's not talk about it. Next question. <laughs> Heather Clark writes to us. Heather wrote, "Who out of the three of you is the best cook?" or enjoys cooking the most, and what would you consider your best or favorite food to prepare? Let's start with the end of that question. I love to cook people breakfast. I love making breakfast for people. Like cool. eggs, omelets. Breakfast? Yeah, well, you've never slept over, have oh, you? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> it's a valuable <laughs> skill because a lot of folks are not good at breakfast, and it is the most important meal of the day. Yeah. I have pretty basic cooking skills myself, but I do enjoy winging it. I like... Uh, Hot dogs and pizza. and uh... <laughs> I have a ridiculous... I'm, I'm not the best cook. Uh, and this sounds like the answer from like a great Gatsby level, like cartoonish Mr. Burns villain. Uh, I do this less than once a year, get to eat lobster. But the act of boiling a lobster is kind of fucking ridiculous. It's monstrous. Yeah. It's killing an animal. Most things, most parts of modern 21st century American food prep don't involve the murder. The murder has happened before you get there. You, 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 you do the humane thing, quote unquote, and put its face in first. I try, yeah. It's never done it. I don't know if I can. It's over in a second, but good Lord, is it bizarre. My, my dad told me that when I was a kid, like really young, like two or three, um, we lived on a beach in Kingston in a place called Gray's Beach. Gray's Beach. Rocky Nook. Oh. And... Uh, they got lobsters and my dad let me and my younger sister play with the lobsters. And the first thing we did was grab the lobsters and run for the water. And my dad had to like chase us down. And then years later, there was a commercial on TV where exactly that happened. And my dad got really misty eyed. He was like, Oh, that that exact thing happened with us. I did. When I was a little kid, I think I did. I was at a wedding or something and I think I sabotaged someone's plate of chicken or something like that. Yeah. Because uh, there was like a whole chicken or something. And I was like, I got to set it free. I, I forget what the story is. But, but it was I, dead, right? I suppose it was. Yeah, I'm trying to picture <laughs> There's this. questions in this story. Wait, so wait, <laughs> I gotta, did it look like a chicken? I was like, I was little, I think. And I was concerned about a, a dead chicken. But it looked like, like a baked thing. chicken, right? I, maybe I'm <laughs> misremembering. What did it look like? Oh, I ran away with something <laughs> screaming animal rights or something like that. <laughs> Or basically like the kid equivalent of that, yeah. <laughs> when I was about six or seven years old, this is a, Heather, this is not the question you asked, but it's, a que- it's the answer you're getting. When I was six or seven years old, I caught a crab at the beach. I put it in the bucket. I went to my mother and father, my mother, I definitely remember, and asked, is this crab big enough to cook? Because I'd brought little, I'd found a bunch of crabs and they'd be like, hey, we can cook these. And I went, no, that's not how this works. There isn't enough like mm, for meat on them. They need to be bigger, like the ones you find at the grocery store. I found a crab that in my six-year-old hands was gigantic. And I said, can we bring them home and cook them? And it's like, I actually caught something we can eat. That was a big deal to a little kid. My mom said, yes. She was almost certainly just pandering to me. I remember the story. I looked down the bucket. It was sad. And some water in it, and it was, and I thought, I'm gonna do the right thing. Little pre Bernie Sanders. Okay, he was around when I was six. I just didn't know who he was. Little Ryan Murphy took the crab out to put him back in the ocean, and he fucking bit me. <laughs> and he went back. I didn't eat him. He was an asshole. He's. I hope he's dead. I hope he's a no, dead crab. Ryan, that crab was like, oh, what a hero. Maybe oh. he's molted his shell. You, you only kidnapped me. <laughs> Over 20 years of shell molting, he's gigantic at the bottom of the ocean. He's coming plotting back. Plotting his revenge like a Lovecraftian Cloverfield. He's going to capture you, come this close to eating you, and then 
spit you back and then you're going to bite him back. Yeah. <laughs> this is good. Fan art for any of the, our patrons. Or oh, friends. but to go back to the actual question. Who's uh, the best cook? I, f- I forgot. I, I, I don't think yeah, any of the best cook. Are you? I don't, you None of us are. It ain't me. I figured Ryan would be. No, no I'm all right. I, no. I, I, I will say I, I think I can make pretty decent deviled eggs, which are comically easy to make, but everyone always says they're really good. Whatever. They are good. I can, I can attest to that. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, for a great question and our meandering answer. Next, from Jeremiah Allworm. Mr. Allworm, I hope I'm saying that correctly. How did you make or where did you source that rad guaranteed audio video synth stinger? Mr. Allworm wants to know where did we where did it come from? How did we make it? Neil, you created the guaranteed audio stinger. I did. I actually don't remember it all that well. It's a very short stinger. It's just like a couple synths. I think I probably I um it's it's like a two sound. So it's one is the first little wiggly which is kind of modeled after the uh like the eighties Disney logo sound. Uh, it's kind mm. of that sound. And then there's like a big chord, which I think might come from an M1 synthesizer sound pack that I had. Uh, so it's, you know, just a couple sounds that I had kicking around and I, uh, I just put them together. You heard that sound at the very beginning of this episode and you'll hear it again at the end. Joey V. Joey V wrote, hey, everyone, I guess this is a Vidnight Society related question. What do you think of Huey Lewis in the news? Hip to be square video. I heard it was filmed with a medical camera, parentheses, the kind they insert into people's holes, and parentheses. <laughs> to get those people's holes. People's yeah. holes. To get those GoPro-like close-ups. I've never seen it used prior to this video, so I wonder if it was a first for music videos at the time. Well, Joey V, I watched the video last night uh, after I read your question. Good work. Had you seen it before? Not in a lot. I remembered it rewatching it, but no, it was not fresh in my memory. I think I feel like sometimes you come over my house and you just throw it on because it's such a weird video. I, I have some thoughts about that video. Um, I, we all like Huey Lewis at this table. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's probably the best Huey Lewis video. It's definitely the most, uh, I guess, cutting edge or just like visually. Well, because uh, doing it all for my baby is way too long, uh, riding the coattails of Thriller. And a lot of the other yeah. videos, I mean, I do like Heart and Soul. That's a good video. I want a new drug is pretty good too. But mm-hmm. the thing I think about whenever this music video pops in my head, which is probably more frequently than most people on this earth, is that it looks like, okay, so when Holland Oates first started making music videos, they clearly just went into a studio one day and shot like three or four really cheap music videos that are just the band on a black background. Look up the music video for You Make My Dreams Come True by Holland Oates, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's just a bunch of close-up shots of them on a black background singing, right? This video is Huey Lewis in the News doing that, and they found a way to make it cool looking. It, it, it kind of like, I don't know, it's super simple. They probably did it real fast. I like all like the cheapo dolly shots where they go across the instruments being played with like the yeah. macro wide lens uh, angle. Um, the only thing I don't like about it aesthetically is that the technology was so early that there's like a certain um, diffusion to the color in it. It kind of has like this Jeffrey Unsworth, like soft feel to the whole thing that I wish it didn't have, but whatever. It reminds you that it was shot with a a cutting edge camera at the time. Yeah. Like like how small this camera is. Medical grade camera. Yeah. 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 I I presume this is a colonoscopy camera. First of all, we all thought about Huey Lewis getting a colonoscopy, right? Yeah. I I smell shit when I watch it and I love this song, (laughs) but how can you not think about speak for yourselves? You fucking weirdos. No, I mean, the lyrics are all about fasting for 24 hours and (laughs) drinking that gross stuff. You got to drink. Well, are they? No, he says, he says, I'm watching what I eat. (laughs) That is a line of the song. (laughs) No, but, uh, I, we, we, I love the video because what year is it from? 86. Yeah, kind of the mid 80s. It feels like a 90s video in that yeah, it's I got a, that it's got a solid gimmick to it, which we weren't really doing. It's got a visual gimmick the way that a Michelle Gondry video might have yeah. later on. And uh, that's all it is. It's just playing around with some technology that other music videos don't have. Yeah. All right, Joey V, in preparation for today's recording, I looked up a few colonoscopy recordings which are easily available on YouTube. There for research, many. right, Ryan? For research. Yeah. Uh, modern colonoscopy cameras do not look like that. They're in widescreen. No, they are, but that's not the They're point. They're much bigger nowadays. So, <laughs> they bigger. 
Life got worse. The only <laughs> thing they should do is they got worse. Now, I know the colonoscopy cameras are actually, dis- again, they're smaller now. They have to They have to be. And I don't know the standard for 1980s. You, if you go on the internet, you can find footage of people's colonoscopies. They share it to be funny. That's almost certainly the only I, what reason. you got to do is you got to type colonoscopy 1986. And I did. And guess did? what? <laughs> not a lot. I not a lot find of ar- nothing. archival colonoscopy. I don't have there is it is a poorly documented field. The early days of colonoscopy. You know what? We got to get uh, Frank Cifaldi on this. I, I was just thinking the, like we're talking of about Congress. like a lot of intellectual stuff, and now we're, we've gone full scatological. <laughs> like I'm just shaking my head. Like Kevin, what have you become? No, I know that colonoscopy cameras are cleaned well because they use they don't like throw away the camera every time. I'm sure they're cleaned pretty well. <laughs> because Huey keeps putting it in his mouth and then I wouldn't let that go. I bet you before the take Huey looking off camera to the DP going, This is a new one, right? <laughs> I'm Huey Lewis. You gotta take care of this throat. <laughs> the bacteria on the camera. <laughs> look up look up the video. It's super fun and weird. Uh, yeah. I love it. Yeah, it's I, great. Oh, it's gr- good. I, I don't know if like, we were gonna oh, like eat it. Like, whoa! That this was- this was good in case we never got around to doing a, a vidnight episode on this video because uh, this was pretty funny talking about this. <laughs> that's uh, what's our next question or last? That's question? the last one. <laughs> well, that's an episode of guaranteed audio in the can. Oh yeah, in the <laughs> yeah, that's the end of your colon. <laughs> Oscopy. And you have no butt puns. <laughs> but it'll be real great. No, I got <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> we can't end this on a bunch of butt jokes, right? <laughs> People can go, oh, it's an interesting documentary. Let's see what this guy does. We'll skip ahead <laughs> of the end. <laughs> and then he eats it. And yeah. smells like poop. Yeah. Yeah. Huey Lewis died today. No, we didn't. No, he did not. Oh, I hope not. He put out a new album, Huey he Lewis, did? in the news. They're putting out a new album, mm-hmm. and it's called The Weather. And it took me a minute Ooh. to get the joke. I got it right away, man. Huey <laughs> Lewis in the news, sports, and the weather. Oh, fuck. It's, it's like 40 years in the making. That's a great joke. That's yeah. great. Oh, that is, that's it's, a way better ending. We're using that. Yeah. Are you serious? He put out I'm a new album dead today? serious. Yeah. yeah. So Let's I, go check it out. Yeah. Yeah.